Right then guys, there's something a little bit different today. This is a BO Card 2000 cassette deck from, I think they're made from 83 to 87. Smooth and Danish. Uh, I've got a little tiki test tape there. This has got a lovely little finish and a little flippy up flap there that you can uh, access the tape. Recording control, Dolby off and on, and you've got a tape selector there between the usual three tapes uh, types. Uh, it's got a DIN plug on it, which will change to RCA because it's generally only plugged into the BO cord stuff, uh, which, because it all sits flat, you need about six acres in your dining room. Uh, all these switches are called Sensi Touch. It was a bit of an invention from Bang & Olufsen, uh, the, one of the first uh, electrical kind of touch sensitive systems, and everything's electronically controlled. So you'll notice that with the, uh, I've put the power on there, when you go and press things, it's basically just clicking. These cool little lights are coming on and not a lot else. So just fire a tape in. Kind of presses in place there. Uh, and with the tape in, it will let you press play, but it won't actually play. So, I mean, it could be anything. It could be the electronic control, belts, who knows. I've not actually been in this yet. So, uh, yeah, the lights lighting up is a good thing, but nothing else seems to be wanting to work. So I'll whip the tape out and let's get into it. See what we've got. So there's a, there's a lot of screws on the back and there's also a lot of screws on the bottom there, but that's an access plate, so we don't have to worry about that for now. So once you've got the four screws out on the back then, uh, this flappy bit on the top just comes off as one unit which is actually really convenient for servicing i'll be honest with you and in there you've got some nice uh to be honest with you late 70s early 80s technology there is some uh, captive nuts that are held in uh, inside that flappy bit there so make sure you don't lose those you could probably replace them with anything to be honest with you but they just sit in that little uh these little recesses in the top of the plate there just there so make sure you don't lose them if you want to make your life easy so inside, because it's a top flappy unit, you find that all the dust gets in there, it's a bit manky. The belt has actually gone hard, which is unusual. Usually they turn to cheese. This one's decided to kind of just uh, just disintegrate, which is actually a good sign because it means that if it's just belts, hopefully we can get this one running. Generally it is all right, a bit manky. I've had worse. Pretty standard motor there with a, a speed pot through that little rubber bit as normal. Electronics are pretty basic, but there's some ICs there. So obviously we're at the start of the 80s now. Power supply is labelled Bang & Olufsen, which is cool. So try and get some of these bits of belt out of here as a starter for tent. And that That's weird. That's just uh, gone hard. Maybe that was just a different kind of belt. Or maybe it's an elastic band. Don't know. Someone's maybe had a go at repairing that. Um, but we'll have a look what that's off. This little rubber bit here. I think that's alright actually. That seems to just be like a little bit of a softener for when you put your tape in. Uh, just to hold it in place really. But reels all seem relatively free. It's not particularly looking that knackered. And uh, there's a little bit of a leaf switch there which we'll give a clean. So, looking inside, then the transport's held in place by three black screws. Uh, one down in there, one down in there, and then the first one I just pointed at there. So let's get them out. And to make life easier, then take those two screws out of the board and just lift this board up and out of the way. Just allows you to get a little bit more wiggle room to, uh, to get that transport and the wires out. And then it's a very... Old school ribbon cable, it reminds me of a BBC micro, but that's enough wiggle room to allow you to try and get this transport out. And just free up all your little wires that you've got there, and there's you know, a couple of clips holding it down. I don't think anybody's been in this before me, if I'm honest with you. Uh, this is another eBay purchase. Um, one of the last eBay purchases I've made, actually. I've ended up with a, a bit of a stock of cassette decks, so I'm trying to thin the herd out a little bit. Uh, and it's just a case of allowing yourself a little bit of wiggle room to get this transport out of the way. 
Honestly, I'm not entirely sure what attracted me to this because it's a bit of a strange one. It's very difficult to stick it in a rack because of its, it's quite flat, it's top mounted. Uh, I think these were designed to be sat on a table along with the, the amplifier and associated record decks and whatnot. But once you've got them three screws out then it's literally just a case of lift and pull and wiggle at the same time and eventually these little tabs where my fingers on the left there they'll kind of come free a little bit and just allow you to get it out. It's only in, held in place to the to the board there with two plugs so we can take those out in a bit. We can have a look at the state of what there is. And it looks like belt cheese. Mmm. Oh well, that's fine. To be honest with you, it's a pretty good sign. If it's filled just due to belts, hopefully there's some chance or a decent chance of getting this up and running. But there is belt everywhere. All around the motor then, the motor seems a little bit stiff as well. It might be a case, it might have a bit of a flat spot on it. Might need to give it a bit of a run. But on the capstan there, you've got half a belt. I'm always impressed at how these belts go and split into loads of little bits. Rather than just just snapping and melting, you know. Um, so lift this little bit of a protector up there. I'll allow you to get these two plugs out. One's for the power and the top one's for the heads. This one's for the heads here. And really tight actually. Cool, and that'll allow you to move this out of the way and start working on the transport. So I'm covered in belt gunk. Um, it's always a good start. And it's one of them things where it just, it, it's like dog poop. If you get it on your hands, it's difficult to get it off. So take this cover off and allow you to remove the capstan. There's a screw here and there's a screw in the same place on the other side. And just give that a pull. It's kind of got these locating tabs that will seats it quite nicely which is a nice little design perk actually and once that's out you can uh, remove that capstan there without too much of a do held in place by the usual uh, plastic wash on the other side this one seems to have failed whilst it was playing so i think the deck is actually kind of still in play mode once that's off then don't drop that on the transport because you'll probably break something but this is uh, a keyed cog so don't lose that and there is our capstan. Only one washer on this, which is a plastic washer holding it in place on the other side of the transport. Uh, obviously the, the, the keyed cog there is enough as of a washer to avoid too much wear and flutter. A little rubber tire there, which seems absolutely fine, strangely. So, uh, but there is belt gun collar on that, on that motor. The pulley on the motor actually drives two separate belts. So you probably find that there's plenty of rubbish there. This pulley here, that magnet there, is a sensor for the system as to whether the tape's stopped or not. So uh, that has to be spinning. If that's not spinning, it won't play. But that is uh, quite firm. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna take the motor off this side, just so I can get a bit more access to it. There's a pulley underneath it there as well, which is a secondary pulley, and uh, it just doesn't really give you much space with it in situ. So, two little screws, standard motor screws to be honest with you, pretty straightforward. And that one's got an earth clamp on it as well. And that'll just allow you to move that out of the way. This isn't plugged in, it's soldered in place, so um, unfortunately it's not that easy to uh, to just to remove. But all that belt's going to have to come out of there. I'm also going to remove that secondary pulley there, which has got belt around it. And do the pause little trick. Uh, I don't use cotton buds um, as much as I can because I don't think they are kind of abrasive enough. They're too shiny. So once you've got them on IPA, they just don't remove anything. You just end up moving it about everywhere. So I like to use cardboard, a bit of corrugated cardboard, dip it in IPA. Honestly, it takes uh, an hour's job is done in minutes. So we'll get all that off. As you can see, it's, I'm covered in this stuff now. But... Uh, that's job number one. Let's clean it up. Transport seems nice and loose. So, as if by magic, da da! I'm pretty sure you don't want to watch me cleaning a uh, belt gunk off, but that was pretty straightforward to clean off. As I say, cardboard dipped in IPA, it just wipes off, soaks into the cardboard. 10 minute job. 
a little bit notchy on that motor there. I'm a bit worried about that, but we'll have a look at that. Might have to replace that motor and might not. But once it's running, uh, we'll test the wow and flutter and see if it's affecting it. It might just need a bit of a run though. Or at least that's what I hope. So we can stick this motor back on now it's clean. It's the same uh, two screws that went back in. And don't forget about that clamp there as well. Alright, and then this one's got a slightly larger screw. If you're mixing up your screws, this one's got a washer on it. And that's how I'll pull it back in place. So now it's time to give it a clean. Get all this dust and hair and fluff. Uh, pinch roller looks really good actually. I'm not going to change that. It's uh, it's not split, cracked, shiny, anything. So that can stay in place. I know it's kind of uh, a hoovering job with uh, with wet cotton buds. I don't mind this because it'll stick to the cotton bud, allows you to get in all the places. But we'll get all the old grease off, all the dust out, clean the heads, pinch roller, everything. We get all this muck off. Well, as much as possible anyway while we're working on the transport but all these uh, mating surfaces where they have friction we'll clean all the gunk off and all the old grease and give these a really good greasing up again with that molly coat to allow it to give the best possible chance of getting a decent sound out of this hopefully um, I'm not going to bore you with 40 minutes of this because that's is how long it's going to take me is uh, about an hour to get all this out but there we go the result is actually a nicely put together transport these solenoids are massive great things and it's all cleaned up relatively nice a bit of fluff in there will blow it out but heads have all cleaned up nice the head itself is in really good nick and so is the pinch roller and i generally think that pinch rollers of the 70s and 80s are made of a lot sterner stuff than the ones you get now so i like to try and keep them in place if i can but all oh, that belt gun came off really nicely pinch rollers in good nick it's not shiny it's not hard so as with the Nakamichi stuff, I like to try and return them if I can. And the head looks in good nick as well. Um, doesn't like it's got any rust or anything like that. So get a belt kit in. So while waiting for the belt kit, what I'm going to do is the DIN cable that this comes with. Um, I don't think personally many people are going to have the full BO cord system. Most people are going to have a normal amplifier that they want to plug RCAs in and use this as a tape deck. And, and it, you know, it could sit on top of a rack instead of a turntable and just look pretty. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert that DIN to uh, an RCA cable out to plug into your amp. And I'm going to convert the uh, in into two plugs on the back of the unit. So I've took that bottom panel off there to access the uh, the main board, which is actually really handy if you need to uh, you know, access any of the board itself to replace caps or whatever. But I'm going to unthread this DIN cable. And this goes into the board here. So what I am going to do is instead of re-soldering wires directly to the board, I'm going to snip this. And then if anybody really wants to uh, remount the DIN cable, it's simply a case of joining some wires. This white one's a data link, which allows you to control the deck. And then you've got uh, left and right in, left and right out, and then a ground in the middle there. So this data link, I've just I've nipped it, but tucked it out of the way. I think that's four volts. This middle one's a ground here, and then it's labelled on the board as to what they, they are left and right in and out, and uh, left and right, sorry, left and right in and left and right out. So pretty straightforward to change up, if I'm honest with you. So these are the in, and the blue and green are the out, but it's marked on the board anyway, and that blue one is totally separate. So I've split the grounds there as well, so we can have a ground to each set of RCAs. And it's just a case of uh, setting these up. So, standard set of reasonable quality RCA cables. And it's just a case of snipping the ends off and exposing the uh, the positive and negative side to each one. Ta-da! Alright, I'm going to go ground to ground, left to left, right to right. And this is the out. So that's the, uh, the two cables on the bottom there. So a little bit of heat shrink to do a, a, a nice tidy job at least. So because don't forget when you put that cover back on this there is uh, another board on top so i don't want to short it out onto anything and uh, you know putting a voltage down your speaker cables or anything stupid like that so it's really just a case of uh, lining up the cables soldering in place and then we're going to put some nice heat shrink over the top to protect everything 
So we'll twist cables together and then uh, apply some solder or solder if you're in America. You know, to my, uh, hello to all my American viewers. I do, looking at my analytics, I do have quite a lot of American viewers. So it's, it's quite nice that I'm getting uh, people having a look from across the pond. The channel's come come quite well it's come on quite nice i'm a bit proud of it actually over the past uh six months or so lots of viewers from lots of different countries it's it's really refreshing and there's a lot of engagement you know people are asking me questions and things like that i really enjoy it uh so we'll stick some decent solder on there i like to spend a bit of money on solder especially when you're wearing together things are gonna have a signal pass down them and then once that's on i'm just gonna slide that heat shrink back over the top to protect it now I've always used the end of a soldering iron to uh, to shrink, heat shrink. I understand, you know, people have heat guns and whatever else, but um, for the very small amount of time I use uh, applying heat shrink, I generally use this kind of rounded bit of the uh, of the soldering iron there. And I am actually impressed that it says Bang & Olufsen on the power supply there. I think that's pretty cool. But, yeah, make them uh, nice and tidy there, or as tidy as Paul can make them. And then we're going to twist both grounds together and connect that to the ground on the on the main board there. And do the best I can at shielding that ground away from anything as well. And then same again. Twist together, solder in place, and um, cover and heat shrink. Uh, this cable actually, because it goes around that kind of curly bit of the chassis as well, there's very limited chance of it being pulled and he's been pulled away but to me this is the this is the right way to connect wires you know um i can see the positive and negatives of going straight to the board and you know desoldering the board but i just thought this would be a bit easier if anybody wanted to revert it but that's as tidy as i can make that today uh, and there's your other end so what i'll do is that board obviously i was on about sits on top so I don't want to short anything to that. Thread it through the hole. And then I'm going to thread that RCA cable there. Back through where the DIN was. And then it can go out the bottom. And that uh, cover plate on the bottom will hold that in place quite nicely as well. So I'll fire that back on there. Top two screws for some reason are totally different. It's two countersunks. I have no idea why. Um, ask the Danes. See what they think about it. But... Um, you, you, what I intend to do next is for the in, for recording, I'm going to use two plugs on the back. So it's just a case of drilling the correct size holes for the plugs. Uh, this seems to be the best place to sight them because there's a little bit of room there. It's not bothering the motor. There's a bit of space. There is a sticker that I've actually moved because I didn't want to drill through the sticker. So uh, a very scientific approach, as you can see. And uh, this drill bit perfectly matches the, uh, the plugs that I bought. I think this is some kind of composite case as well. It's not plastic. So it, uh, it drilled pretty easily though. And once we're through, it's just a case of threading these plugs in, tightening them up, and then we'll solder the wires to the in. The reason that I have used plugs for in and a cable for out is, in my mind, not everybody will want to record onto tapes. And I might be wrong, but this is only my view. So if I put two cables on, you might end up with a cable flapping about the place that you would never use. Whereas you're always going to need a cable to go out of the unit and into your amplifier, you don't always need a cable to record if you don't fancy recording. So the plugs look pretty cool. It's a great place to put them. So that was my, my thinking with this. Um, but once they're in, just kind of tighten the nuts up as best you can. And from experience, you need to make sure these are tight as well because there's nothing worse than putting a, a plug in the socket later on and you find that it's wobbly. But I think these were four or five pounds for the pair off eBay. And they did take a bit of finding, actually. I couldn't get the terminology right, but chuck a bit of solder in the uh, in the ports in the back there first. And I've already tinned. I've gonna, I'm going to use four separate wires. I've already tinned the wires, which means I've put a bit of solder on the end of each one. Uh, and then it's just a case of literally offering the wire up and, uh, and then just, you know, it'll connect. Because you've already tinned that wire. There's a little bit of solder on it already and, and you're laughing there and it'll just keep in place quite nicely. There is two earth points. They're, they're kind of like washers with a leg on them and uh, they're flat at the moment. So once we've done this, I'll bend them down and then we can attach our earth cables to them. 
So there's the first one, it's just got a knife behind it because it's right up against the chassis. And then the second one's exactly the same. Just bend them into place. And then, uh, same again. So we're gonna put two, uh, two separate earth cables to them. You could put a small earth cable between the two if you wanted, and then one cable from there to your, your shared ground on the board that we just looked at, but um, I just, I had two cables and I thought it looked a bit nicer. So rather than a tiny cable and a long one, I thought it'd be a bit more interesting who's ever going to go in this unit ever again in in the in the history of it i have no idea you know uh but i like to do a tidy job as best i can to be honest with you so and they're sufficiently away from each other as well that they're never going to touch which is also good so we'll tidy them wires up as well and then uh there's a little bit of a gap underneath where the transport goes to allow you to thread those wires just to the side of the RCA cable you can see on the right uh, and they'll be held in place um, but once you get the transport in, once you get that top board in as well so we'll just twist them together because it's a shared earth anyway and then we can uh, we can solder them to that main ground connection on the board uh, ready? oh I'd like that that took me about 10 minutes when I was editing to do that uh, so same again really, I'm not going to get too excited about showing you how to solder two wires together but um, I've really planned this heat shrink, obviously you've got to plan heat shrink, you've got to put it on the wires before you attach them all together so uh, I really want this looking as neat as possible. So I've uh, used two small bits of heat shrink for the uh, for the left and right speaker wires here, uh, sorry RCA wires and then I've, I've got a big bit to go over the connection as well so it can all be joined together for a bit of added security. And uh, just using my soldering iron to shrink that heat shrink. Heat shrink's amazing and it's like three quid for a big bag off eBay and you can get loads of different sizes. And it just makes you feel like you've done a, a real nice tidy job. And then a bigger bit over the two. It just means that they can be connected together under one bit of heat shrink but have no chance of touching each other either. Uh, and obviously make sure that you've got your left and your right the correct way around. I always remember red is right because it starts with R. Uh, and that's us really, nice and tidy. Hopefully once this is done now we'll get the uh, everything back together. Postman's going to deliver me some belts and we can crack on and get the belts on and get it working. Alright, so I've got some belts through, belts turned up. Uh, I created a link uh, to a video. Uh, I'll put the link in the description, how to calculate the correct belt size for something when it's either 20 quid for a belt or... You just can't find one and then these two were ones i had lying about that seemed to fit quite well so first thing i'm going to do before we get to uh fitting the belts is transport's all clean we're going to oil some specific points uh all the places that need a little bit of oil so we're going to do um right down into the pinch roller and then what else? Basically all the points that have rotational axles. Just gonna give them a little bit of an oil with our trusty slug slime. That one is right in there, which is why this is handy, because otherwise we're no chance without stripping it. Okay, and then I'm going to uh, put some grease on the places where it's metal on metal. Seems to be about three or four places. Let's go oh, handy dandy. Molly coat DX again and give a little bit in there and some in there and in there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of hold that transport up a little bit in order to allow me to get into some of these. And you don't have to go crazy with this stuff. It will uh, 
a little bit would be absolutely fine. And it also seems like a kind of bad ball bearing down in there. I'll give that a bit of an oil. Smooth as butter. Okay. And then before I put the capstan back on, when we're going to fit our belts, I'm going to put a little bit of oil in here. That goes in there and this is keyed, so you've got to kind of uh, make sure it sits seated in there. And then we're going to put that. That's it. And then on the other side needs to go that uh, clear plastic washer on there. Just to be sure that you're not going to get any oil in any of your tips, let's give that a little bit of a clean. Don't forget that bit because that's what keeps the capstan in place. So, the first belt we've got is on the tip side. It's a small one to this uh, over here. And what this is, is, is your sensor to make sure that it knows when it comes into your tape. So the eagle eye of you realize that I just took that capstan back out again. So this belt goes around underneath that pulley. It's gonna go over here and then under and onto that wheel. And then that's driven by the motor. Nice one. And I'll stick the capstan back in again. And make sure that plastic washer's back in place again. See, I'll share my errors with you guys. Otherwise, you'll think I'm just perfect. And that is leaving us with our final belt which is this bad boy which is massive this is a big old belt and that is us all singing, all dancing. I think it's time to get this back in and give it a test. Um, make sure before you fit the transport, we put this plate back on and the two screws that hold it in place and that this bit that sticks out, sticks out away from the transport. Fits in a little groove down there, look. So, hopefully, without too much uh, of a do, I can get this to kind of go where I want it. Phew uh, That was about four minutes of jiggling. So um, I'm not going to screw it down. We're just going to get it plugged in and see if, we, you know, see if it works, see how it runs and whatever else. I have a suspicion that this motor is going to be quite loud. It just, it just has that feel to it. It's got a couple of rough spots. I think it's been sat for a long time. Right then, yeah, so I just pulled them RCAs out of the way for a second there. Just to make sure I don't catch them on anything, but it's a good position that I think we think we'll be alright. So, right, let's plug it in, see what it does. So, I did plan on putting this back together and getting it started, but a little bit of fun and games. So, basically, um, when I started wiring everything up and I powered it up and everything, uh, got a little poof of smoke out of the motor. And the motor finally gave up. So this is the motor that uh, that was originally on it. And basically it seems that... So this is a little bit of circuit board that is on the back of the motor. And that's in a metal chassis. And it appears that this uh, transistor is shorted to ground. You can see there's some burning on the, on the centre pole of it there. Which has in turn completely melted the back of the motor. And uh, much to my best efforts I've had the back of this off a few times. And whatever else. It is, uh, it's melted the bush housing and basically that motor is never going to run again. So, what I've had to do basically is scout round in my parts pile. 
So as you can see, we have a replacement motor on now. Uh, it's 12 volts, it's exactly the same, it's the same fit, and basically that is now uh, housed and in there. So I'm gonna rebuild this transport for a second time. I didn't see the point of showing you the motor swap because it's basically those two screws and that's it. So now I'm gonna rebuild it again, put it in and see what happens. This transport, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, trying to get it in is one of the most unfun things I've ever done. So I have replaced this one resistor at R8, which is known to cause power issues. So I've replaced it out of routine. Uh, I've also made sure this belt isn't too tight. The first one was a bit too tight and it was slowing down and rewind fast forward. So this is perfect now. So now let's fire a tape in and hopefully it'll all go to plan. Yeah, player's working fast forward. It's not slowing down to good speed. That's all due to that resistor R8. Just make sure you replace it out routine. It's 47 ohms fusible resistor. Pretty common to tape decks if I'm honest with you, but it seems to have done the job with this one. Let's rewind him, fast forward him. I'm happy with that. Once it's playing, we've got good levels. And it looks cool, let's be honest with you, that does look cool. The RCA's plugs are fitted on the back. It seems to be a perfect place to put them and a good fit for the RCA in. And it's playing with no real dramas and no real worries. Cleaned up nicely. All along the boards and all that were pretty clean anyway, but um, let's do some testing and some calibrating. So I'm going to do quite a bit of calibration testing all in one go here. And what I've got now is this uh, ceramic screwdriver for changing the speed on the motor pot. It just means that you're not going to get any shorts or anything like that. And you've got a standard hole in the top of the motor there for access to the potentiometer for adjusting the speed. And you can quite safely fire this in now because it's not metal. And uh, just let that sit in the hole there until we get our speed up. I've got my test tape. This one's got 6.3 kilohertz on it as its first tone. Just picking one off random. So we'll try that. And once this is going... We'll just adjust the pot, speed it, down, speed it down a little bit and try and get it to 6.3 kilohertz. Excellent. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire 3000 hertz in through the RCA ins and I'm going to record it. So this will also test the RCA ins and it will also reconfirm everything is working and correct when I play it back. And there it is playing back at 3000 hertz. So we've calibrated and checked two things all in one go there. Happy with that. And the next test is to do is we're going to fire some uh, YouTube music in the RCA ins. And we're just going to let that record and then play it back and see what it sounds like. Levels are right. And if we give that a rewind and a play, it should sound exactly as intended. This gives us a check to make sure the levels are right and everything sounds good. And it does. Sounds really good, actually. Tape's nice and smooth. It's not wobbling all over the place or anything crazy. Levels are as expected. It can be adjusted by the slider or the input device. The strange thing with this is because there's no monitor function on this deck, you've got to have the monitor from your input at the same time. And that's maybe something we can change in the future. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. I believe some BO chord stuff you can make the monitor signal come out of the speakers by clipping diodes, but that's yet to be investigated and I'm happy how it is. So now that's all done, all that's left to do now is replace the cover. This slots in the front once you've lined up your sliders for your recording volume and your switches. And then screws in place via the screws on the back and the captive nuts that slide down into the, into the cover itself. Just give that a check, make sure your switches are all okay and your slider's correct. And then you're good to go. So this has been a bit of an interesting project really because it's been a bit of everything. 
it's had a motor, it's had belts, it's had gunk, uh, it's had electrical issues, it's had a resistor replacement. I've a, 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 pulled the DIN and put RCA ins and outs. And to be honest with you, all in all, it's been quite enjoyable. It plays back really nice. Sound quality is excellent for what it is. And even though it's a two-head deck, it's a little bit funky and it's a little bit different compared to the usual things you see on a rack and everything else, you know? I think the design's a strong point on this. And I think that's what brings a lot of people to this Bang & Olufsen stuff and the BO chord system itself, is that it's just a little bit different. And sometimes, that's exactly what we need. Because if everything was the same, what's the point? All in all, it's led to a nice, sleek, smooth and fully working deck that's been rescued, you know? Up until the point of starting to look at this, this was something that was potentially fit for the bin or fit for spares. And with a little bit of care and attention, it's back in use again. If you enjoyed my videos, please like and subscribe. Hope you have a nice day. Take care.